Okay, well, welcome Tensor Network enthusiasts of this world. During these daring times, I don't know any better distraction than thinking about the inner workings of strongly correlated systems through the eyes of entanglement and tensors. Stephen White is the man who gave us these eyes. Standing on the shoulders of Kenneth Wilson, he developed the Density Matrix Organization Group and was the first human to set foot on the planet of entanglement. A small four pages in PNL, a giant 6,000 papers using it for our tensor network kind. It is therefore an immense honor to have Steve as the inaugural speaker of this new online seminar series. We very much hope that you will feel inspired by the talks to come and welcome questions and comments after the talk. Without much further ado, here is the one and only superstar of our community, Stephen White. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a little bit over the top, but uh, thank, thanks, Frank. We might want to check the connection settings. Right. One of my smart devices started talking. I heard something. Okay, so let me share my screen. Okay, and everybody can see this, I assume. Okay, so uh, first let me say uh, um, uh, greetings to uh, all the friends. I saw, uh, you know, many friends' names on, uh, uh, on the list of people uh, attending. Uh, thanks for attending. And uh, um, the one, one drawback of Zoom is that you can never have sort of little one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations. But... Uh, uh, greetings, everyone. So let me hit play here. And um, so I'm going to uh, tell you about uh, uh, superconductivity in the Hubbard and TJ models. Um, so this is something that I've been uh, working on for a, a long time, since uh, I guess the late 80s, back originally with uh, Quantum Monte Carlo. Um, and um, uh, so uh, uh, recently this has gotten um, uh, Pretty exciting with uh, the simulation techniques, particularly tensor networks, uh, being uh, particularly effective. And uh, so we're getting lots of new results. So I thought I would sort of uh, give you an overview, um, particularly in regards to superconductivity. Superconductivity has been the hardest thing to sort of figure out in these models. So I'll start with a review of um, the models and uh, some old results, uh, mostly with Doug Scalpino, who uh, said he was going to join us um, uh, on the TJ model. Um, then talk about uh, uh, some uh, uh, studies that we've done with uh, multiple techniques sort of combining forces uh, on the Hubbard model. Uh, and then it's gradually getting to more recent results. I'll talk about our results for superconductivity in the two-dimensional limit at doping of one-eighth, where we combine DMRG and the uh, a particular type of uh, uh, quantum Monte Carlo. And a uh, key question is the interplay between stripes and superconductivity, does it suppress superconductivity? And finally, finally I'll show you some uh, very new results unpublished on DMRG in the uh, TJ cylinders, where we're seeing now much clearer signs of superconductivity. Okay. So uh, let me introduce the models first. Um, so there's the 2D Hubbard model and sort of a family. Um, we sort of think of these as being the key descriptions of uh, the cuprate superconductors. And um, so the, where's my mouse? My mouse has seemed to have disappeared. Let me drop out of this just for a second. There's my mouse, let me try again. For some reason, it doesn't show my mouse. It shows my mouse on this page, but not on the next page. Okay, I don't understand that. Okay, so um, anyway, uh, I don't need the mouse too much for this, but if we um, look in the upper right, we see the usual uh, phase diagram for the cuprates. And um, so it's, we describe these with a family of models, and if you wanna go to more detail, you can look at the three-band Hubbard model, which has the most realistic description of the cuprates. Um, this has a variety of parameters shown in um, a little figure with the uh, green and red dots. Um, then we can simplify that to a one-band Hubbard model. 
Um, so the red dots between the links are oxygen atoms, and we tend to think of those as being sort of stepping stones for the electrons to hop between uh, the copper sites. And um, so uh, the one-band Hubbard model is a simplification, uh, but it's also more general and may apply to other uh, systems, not just the cuprates. It also has a weak and a strong coupling regime. Uh, then we could go to the TJ model, which is simpler still. It removes the double occupancy. Um, and uh, so it applies only to the strong coupling regime. Okay, so let me say a few notes about the experiments on the cuprates. Uh, mostly I'll be um, not talking about any ex experiments. Uh, that's a very complicated field in itself. But a few notes. Um, first of all, the pairing that one sees is generally always D-wave uh, pairing. Um, and um, there's two different regimes where you dope it with holes or dope it with electrons. In this upper right diagram, the hole doping on the, on, is on the left, and that generally gives you a higher TC. Um, now, if you map things to the one-band models, then roughly we can take into account the difference between hole doping and electron doping with um, a T prime. And the T prime is always going to be uh, a diagonal interaction, a diagonal hopping. Okay? So if T prime is less than zero, that maps roughly to the hole dope system. So we expect higher TC, stronger superconductivity. And T prime greater than zero is the electron dope side. Um, and finally, stripes uh, have been seen in uh, many materials, particularly, and the sort of uh, early pioneer of that was John Tranquata. <clears throat> so the, uh, a little bit about the physics, uh, just thinking about the one band models. Um, so it's, it's the physics of a square lattice with uh, electrons on them, which can have uh, vacancies and double occupancies and single spins. In the large U limit, um, we're thinking mostly about the vacancies, which we call holes. And a key to the physics is that the hole hopping in the antiferromagnetic background is frustrated. So the system wants to have both antiferromagnetism, but the holes moving around freely to have low kinetic energy. And if a hole in this lower picture hops two sites to the right, then um, it displaces the, essentially trades places with the spins, and it makes a line of um, bonds which are parallel. So the antiferromagnetism is messed up. So the red uh, Y bonds are messed up antiferromagnetism because the hole has hopped two sides to the right. So that's in terms of sort of simple strong coupling pictures of what's going on, that's sort of the, uh, a nice simple picture. Okay, so, um, uh, let me now talk about early DMRG results. Uh, these went on for a good while uh, uh, in collaboration with Doug Scalpino. Um, here's a picture with me and Doug. This was just before everything closed down with, uh, with social distancing. This was uh, uh, right at the beginning of February. I, I was, uh, this is the beach right by his house. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we did DMRG um, on cylinders and of course, um, the difficulty of doing the 2D version of DMRG is that, uh, you know, with the area law entanglement, the difficulty, the numerical work increases exponentially with the cylinder width. So I wonder why I can't, I still can't show a mouse. Let me, let me try to stop. Let's see if I can keep it. Does anybody have any experience with Show, letting your mouse show up. I need to play settings, this. In the settings, you can change it, it whether the mouse should show up during presentation mode or not. I think. Uh, in the settings for Zoom. No, in the settings of Keynote. Okay. Preferences. Uh, and uh, let's see. Does anyone slideshow? Exit. Show. Show pointer on. Ah. Show pointer when using. I'm seeing your mouse. I'm seeing your pointer at least. Hi, Doug. Um, Hi. I'm seeing. Okay. I'm seeing yeah. your pointer. Okay, good. Yeah. I, I think I might have fixed it now. Okay, let's try again. Okay, it's showing up. Great. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> um, let's see. For the TJ model, um, back then, uh, with the sort of state of the art computers and techniques, we could. 
I'll get good results up to a width of eight. And um, nowadays, um, just uh, with better techniques, and com especially computers, we can go up to width 10 or 12. Um, and so the first question is, do two holes doped in the TJ model attract? And uh, so the idea is that these holes might form Cooper pairs, uh, sort of real space Cooper pairs. If they bind, then you could think of them as um, uh, sort of Bose condensing, and uh, that'd be sort of a simple way of thinking about the superconductivity. Okay, uh, now does this depend on the parameters? Or uh, does it, do they bind in only some regimes? And then, Further, um, if you put in lots of holes in the system, does it form a superconducting state? Or do they phase separate or do they do something else, such as stripes? Okay, and here's the pattern of the uh, uh, DMRG uh, snake uh, that maps it onto 1D that we use. Okay, so here are two uh, movies going simultaneously that show two different parameters. Each of these starts essentially in a product state, and there are two holes doped, one on the left side of the system and one on the right side of the system. Um, the two different cases are I put in a T prime equals 0.3, and I put in a T prime of minus 0.3 um, on the two sides. Okay, and uh, so what happened, uh, I'll, I'll start this again. So uh, the two holes started uh, apart and um, as the DMRG evolved we see the energy decreasing we see the number of states kept increasing okay and um, what happens is in the the model the parameters with the T prime positive on the left the two holes see each other and they bind together and you see this uh, pair of holes just forming one packet in the center but with T prime negative the uh, uh, two holes simply stay far apart and so this is sort of a nice way to sort of see whether, you know, sort of a very clear cut way to see, yeah, look, there's certainly a, a, a tendency in this case for these uh, uh, holes to bind into these pairs. Okay, now let's look at the case where we put in more holes. Um, so this is a case, this has uh, T prime equals zero and uh, eight holes are put in. And so this is uh, just at about the beginning of the system, the, the run where these eight holes are just sort of sitting in the center of the system, okay? And we let it run, does the DMRG sweeping, energy goes down, and we sort of see what the system wants to do. And so it immediately spreads out because it wants this sort of kinetic energy of the holes, and then it starts getting, gets, getting some more structure to it. And um, so it doesn't just sort of spread out into a uniform blob, you can see stripes forming. Uh, so we see a left stripe and a right stripe, and they slowly push apart. And they slowly evolve. Sometimes they look like site-centered stripes. Sometimes they look like they're centered on the bonds. They gradually separate apart. So in all these plots, the size of the circles is proportional to the hole doping. And to see it more clearly, it's the diameter of the holes that is proportional to the hole doping. Um, and um, the color coding of the arrows is to show you the, the different phases um, or domain, domain walls of the uh, anti parallel magnetism. So an up, if it's on an even site, is one color, and if it's an odd site, it's on another color. And this is all automatic. So what we see is that in between these two stripes, so this is, these are, this is a cylinder, an open cylinder, and so these two stripes have wrapped around. Okay? And um, each stripe acts like a domain wall, switching between the blue and the green phase. Um, and that's sort of an essential uh, part of what these things do. Okay. Uh, so now we can ask all sorts of questions about this and sort of perform numeric different numerical experiments. So this is an experiment where we try to see how robust is this uh, domain wall nature of the, uh, on the anti magnetism across the stripe. Okay, so to, to do this experiment, I put a, a pinning field temporarily on the two sides of the system that force the system to be in the same domain. Uh, sorry, sorry, I forced them to be in opposite domains because it wants to split into two stripes. Okay, so that set up this regime where it's sort of favoring one stripe. Now I turn off the edge fields 
that are forcing it, and then it's back to the sort of free Hamiltonian that can do what it wants. Okay, so now it's trying to split into two stripes, but it's doing it in a little bit disorganized fashion because the spins are a little bit frustrating it. And, but, and then sort of through numerical, you know, random numbers, it's not quite balanced between the two sides. And so all of a sudden it decides, no, I'm going to, it really wants to uh, make every stripe be a domain wall. So it flips the right hand side. Okay. So, um, so the conclusion is that if there is a stripe, this domain wall across it is, is uh, very robust. Okay, now that, those were simulations with the set. So I, I'm emphasizing this uh, diagonal hopping, hopping T prime because um, we found it. Could, could, I, could I ask a question? Please go ahead. Um, okay, so, um, so I'm, I'm a bit unfamiliar with this um, uh, type of analysis that you're doing where you're um, running the MRG and, and you seem to be getting sort of dynamical information from this. Um, which is confusing to me because it seems to me like I mean, you're just running the MRG, you're always supposed to find the unique ground state. It, I, that, like, right, okay. Yeah, so, so, so could you elaborate so, a bit, the, like the reason? Yes, yes, like, yeah. yeah. So there's a story behind this. Um, so I was, so, you know, the traditional way might be to just uh, do the DMRG run. You know, I would always monitor what the calculations were doing along the way. So, you know, sort of seeing the path that the simulation takes to find um, the ground, it, what it thinks is the ground state. Okay, but um, when I would present results with sort of the final results, people wouldn't see all of the detail that I had seen. And in particular, I gave a talk at Stanford and um, Bob Laughlin um, really didn't trust my results because he couldn't see what I had seen. And uh, so he sort of heckled me, uh, which, uh, you know, I don't think is that unusual for Bob Laughlin. But, uh, uh, so, uh, so at that point, I decided, okay, I, you know, if he had seen what I saw in watching the, the, the state evolve, uh, he would believe it just as, as much as, as I, I did. So I started figuring out how to make movies. And so these movies were incredibly primitive, but they worked. And then the next time I gave a talk in front of Bob Laughlin, he just was singing praises to everything. But the idea is that, you know, it, you can get a sense of how DMRG lowers the energy of the state. And DMRG will do it, and you know, this is sort of what you expect from any tensor network methods. It will, um, try to uh, reduce the energy at a sort of local level, get the local correlations right. And then the energy scales for sort of long distance things are uh, much lower and the sweeping takes a lot longer to build that in. And you may not see it totally find the ground state um, if for long distance mode. So if we do it on a big anti magnet, you know, as long as the system is finite, it should go into a spin singlet state where you would see no moments whatsoever. But if the system is big enough, you're just not going to see that. It sort of breaks its symmetry. So real systems break symmetry and DMRG breaks symmetry too. And, um, but you know, once you sort of look at these sorts of things, you really get a lot of insight into the system. Okay. Oh, sorry to interrupt, Steve. Uh, we, we hear you yeah. less clearly than before. Maybe you, can you, did you do something different? Not, let me just double check. Uh, let me go here. Um, I am not experiencing any problems with the audio. I hear you just fine. Okay, then it's okay. Yeah. Okay, it's okay. It's probably continue. not me then. Okay. Okay, uh, so. Um, so you, you, you get a feel for like local minima and, and semi-pseudo stability and, and stuff um, with this. Yes. By, by looking yes, at you the, get, the dynamics. You get a, like yes, that. you get a lot of insight into that. And okay. um, you get sort of, you know, some of, the, some of the behavior appears a little bit more classical and some of it, the local things are, are purely quantum mechanical and you sort of see it, you know, building in sort of a more wider range of the quantum mechanical correct behavior. Um, so that's what you should sort of be getting from looking at these movies, this sort of sense. Okay. Did, um, do they, like, 
I'm sorry to go on. It's just it it's, it is a very cool thing. Um, so it, is it? Um, do do you know the, if, if this then sort of resembles um, the actual dynamics? How this would go? It um, it may resemble um, imaginary time uh, dynamics. Certainly not okay. real time dynamics so much, but more okay. like imaginary time dynamics. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so um, here's uh, a movie where um, the question is, does this stripe formation depend on the parameters? And so this has uh, T prime equals positive 0.2. Um, and so as soon as this um, simulation starts, you sort of see that the, the state that it has found is different. It hasn't immediately lengthened into a stripe. It, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, look the same. And so if you just stop the simulation here, you might say, oh, this looks like it's phase separated. All the holes are sort of staying in a clump. Okay, but that is not what it really wants to do. That was just a sort of local minima. And then what you're seeing here is uh, the system separating into two different pairs. Okay, so I think that should sort of be clear that the lower left there's a pair and the upper right is a pair. And uh, it's not making stripes, okay? So the stripe formation depends on parameters. And certainly if you think of a system breaking into pairs, you might think, okay, this is um, a candidate for superconductivity. But just to emphasize, this is not a totally converged calculation. We're still seeing sort of a broken symmetry in the antiferromagnetism. We're not seeing the pairs delocalized throughout the system. That's sort of a different level of complexity of the wave function, an extra amount of entanglement that we don't capture right away with DMRG. But nevertheless, if you ask the right questions, sort of like, well, do, does it want to do stripes or does it want to do pairs, you see the answer clearly. Okay, now um, for results on superconductivity on, on pairing, the, um, uh, the results were uh, not as easy to understand as uh, with the uh, um, uh, with the striping, but uh, let me sort of go over some of these early results. Okay, so it turns out that uh, this T prime parameter plays a key role. And so in the upper left, we see uh, a system, three different systems with different T primes, and this is the final state for each. And if we crank up the T prime, we see a uniform state. It still has a substantial amount of uh, magnetism. It's broken symmetry, but it's sort of still there. And then we, look, we measure pairing correlations. Uh, we make a D wave operator in one point and uh, measure it on another point. And um, at T prime equals 0.1, we're sitting here with essentially no response. But with the bigger T prime, we're seeing pairing correlations that are fairly significant. And you might think that the numerical value 0 0.01 is, is rather small. You shouldn't think that because um, the operators that we create, you can make to create a pair are very, uh, only have a modest overlap with the actual structure of a pair. So you get a sort of constant factor that, that um, reduces quite a bit. And so we're really looking more at the decay. And so you get a big response for this positive T prime. Um, and if you look at how that corresponds to the striping up here, so it looks like if you have stripes that are too strong, you get no pairing. And if you sort of, if stripes can still be there, but if they're sort of a little bit broader and, and more spread out, you can get pairing. Okay, and then um, in the center figure, um, it's uh, interesting to try to get the stripes to run longitudinally. So my cylinders are always laying flat. They're connected in the top and the bottom. And so here are two stripes in a width eight system that are running longitudinally. And um, that's interesting because there had been earlier complaints that maybe all of the stripes I was seeing was just Friedel oscillations. Okay, but there's no Friedel oscillations if they're running longitudinally. Um, and then we can uh, make a different kind of measurement. So the lower left was a pairing correlation. Here's a, a pairing sort of susceptibility where we put a pair field operator that creates or destroys a pair on the edges of the system, and then we measure the response. Now, the, we only do it on these four bonds. We only put an applied field. The dashed lines, 
the thickness of the line is showing the strength and the dashed lines are opposite in sign to the solid lines. So this pattern here is clearly showing that it wants to be D wave, okay? And the, the response from applying this small field on the edge is persisting all the way through the system. So it, we're seeing a response to the pairing uh, along, the, uh, um, along this length of the stripe, okay? And in order to force these stripes to, to run longitudinally, nor normally they just want to run, run vertically. To get them to run horizontally, we had to change the uh, parameters, the J in the vertical direction versus the J in the horizontal direction, a little bit to sort of tweak it to make it want to, them to run this way. Um, finally, um, I don't want to give much in the way of details of this right-hand figure, but um, it shows you the pairing response um, versus the um, number of holes per unit length in a stripe. So this is an experiment with just one stripe. And the biggest response you get is with this positive T prime. And if you put a negative T prime, you get a very weak response down here. Okay, so that's all pretty clear, except for one thing. Um, so the pairing response is strong for positive T prime and weak for negative T prime, but T prime less than zero is supposed to correspond to the high TC whole doped coup rates, which have stronger superconductivity. And so that's exactly the opposite of what we would have expected. Okay, so there's a, there's a puzzle. Okay, but that sort of summarizes um, the result. So let me, let me just summarize that. So the summary from the early TJ results is there's a key unexpected feature that we found was that stripes were present in most of the phase diagram. And then these stripes make robust antipromagnetic domain walls. Um, the stripes are caused by the same competition between whole motion and local antipromagnetic order that causes um, pairing. So let, let me explain that in a little bit more detail. So I said at the beginning that this frustrated whole motion is uh, a way to think about why the, the physics is the way it is. So if you have one hole that moves from left to right, um, it disrupts all the spins in the pattern. But if I make two holes move together, say I take these two holes and I hop them to um, sites to the right, it just displaces the spins that they went by. And so we have a happy system. So two holes moving cancels out the string of, of bad bonds. And so it's a sort of simple reason to understand pairing. But if you do that same level of sort of cartoon picture of what's going on in strong coupling, suppose I have a stripe of holes and then I move the stripe one site over to the right. And let's assume that the stripe of holes is actually a domain wall, like in this figure. So if it's a domain wall, um, then when it moves over, the, the sites on the left are perfectly happy. Everything is perfectly happy. There's no frustrated bonds. So this is a sort of cartoon argument that says, okay, I'm happy with either pairs or stripes. Uh, if the stripes are there, I want them to be in a domain wall. And that's exactly what we were seeing in the simulations. Okay, so now let's talk about the Hubbard model. So DMRG is harder to do on the Hubbard model. Um, it's, um, you know, it's the coefficient in front of the area law. So there's uh, four degrees of four, four states per site instead of three. Um, there's. Uh, Could you know, I ask you one one quick question before you move please, on to this? Yes. So yes. A, a stripe is a one-dimensional object. If it was going to move, it would move by bending. You would think, right? They would set out at like an amoeba rather than moving all together. So and but I can't think through what the amoeba-like motion should look like. Yes. So if it moves a, a little bit about, if I moved this guy over and then right. I moved another one, um, right. you can sort of picture that and. and you know, it's um, okay. So that that also works. All right, you're saying yeah, that would move yeah. a segment over. Okay. All right. Good. Right. So, so these are these are okay pictures. You know, it's all cartoons and you yeah. know, uh, pretty rough. But it sort of gets a you know, as far as I can tell, it sort of gets a lot of the essence right. And the pandemic cartoons <clears throat> is what you should be watching. Yeah. Okay. So um, what about uh, the Hubbard model? So it's it's harder to do. Um, and historically, there were lots of other simulation methods, and they had given a range of different answers. For quite a while, while we seem to be the only ones that were 
getting stripes, except for um, you know the simplest sort of Hartree Fock calculations. And um, so uh, it was a little so it was sort of unclear. And so um, when our Simons collaboration on the many electron problem uh, formed, we decided to do a Hubbard benchmark paper where we sort of collected sort of just about every reasonable um, simulation method we could think of and just try to compare results. And uh, in many cases, we could sort of uh, pick out the methods that were sort of competitors for being um, you know, quite reasonable and other ones one shouldn't look at too much anymore. Okay, and this was uh, one of the sort of biggest uh, collaborations that I've been, maybe the biggest collaboration I've ever been involved in. Here's all the, the people and all the different methods. Um, and uh, so the, the part that was sort of of most interest in this sort of phase diagram showing some of these different results is, um, so this is at zero temperature, and we were looking here at uh, a doping of 1, 8, and uh, U over T equals 8. And here's some of the results. And um, if we just look at the ones that are sort of right near the red X, there's a sort of degenerate set of sort of high quality methods that sort of deserved a lot more uh, uh, investigation to see what, if we could resolve. Because at this point, the uh, results in that regime were not, not all consistent. Okay, so we um, launched a, a study with four different methods um, and uh, sort of experts in each of these methods. So we had our uh, DMRG and uh, this included um, um, new hybrid real momentum space results that uh, uh, George Ellers and Reinhard Noack had developed. Um, each of these methods have uncontrolled errors. So for, in particular for DMRG, the main error is the finite cylinder size. Okay, uh, Garnet Chan had developed the uh, density matrix embedding theory, and that has an uncontrolled error with the finite cluster size, uh, but that was doing very well in the study. Uh, we have IPEPS with uh, Philippe Corbeau, uh, hi Philippe, and uh, um, the uncontrolled he errors here are finite bond dimension and the need to extrapolate. And finally, we have um, a particular type of quantum Monte Carlo. Of course, that quantum Monte Carlo has um, a sign problem. Um, but uh, this type of Monte Carlo has a, a constraint on the wave, on the trial, on the sort of on the motion, the Monte Carlo evolution. It's um, an uncontrolled error what this constraint does, but it turns out to, to, to work very well. Uh, but it has to be sort of checked with other methods where we understand the, the errors better. So a key aspect of this work is that the uncontrolled errors in these cases are very different. And so um, if you have multiple methods agree, then you can have much more confidence in getting the right answer. Okay. So um, there was a lot of sort of improvement of techniques and, and cross-checking in this. And here's a particular example where we learned something about our DMRG um, in comparing with this Monte Carlo. So here's a system um, with uh, a, a long system, and it's, you can see the stripes in this system. And here's another ground state, or another very low energy state. So these two systems have exactly the same cluster, exactly the same model parameters. Everything about the Hamiltonian is the same, but they start with a different initial state. And the difference between them is the filling of the stripes. So they all have, they both have 24 holes, but this one, the top one has them divided into six stripes with four holes, and the bottom one has them divided into four stripes with six holes, okay? And these are both metastable within DMRG, and the normal way we do that, resolve this sort of thing is we look at the energy, okay? So in comparing with the Monte Carlo, um, so first of all, we found that the Monte Carlo seemed to be doing very well, um, but the Monte Carlo was coming out with a different answer than we were getting with which of these two were lower in energy. We eventually resolved this to an issue with the, the DMRG convergence, and that's shown down here. So the, what we think is eventually the low energy state starts with small bond dimension as a higher energy state. Okay, and then there's sort of a crossing over but it's a very subtle crossing over because you can see that these are, as I go down these lines, this is the final sweep. 
And the final sweep is the higher energy guy is still at a lower energy, it's at a lower energy than the final sweep here. So unless you do this careful extrapolation to see where they're going, you would say that the blue is better. Okay, and so we did not look at this carefully enough until we had sort of the looking at the, the uh, Quantum Monte Carlo and trying to resolve the differences. And then once we looked at this, it sort of agreed very well with the Monte Carlo. Okay, so that's an important, um, uh, important sort of potential mistake to look out for when you're doing certainly DMRG, uh, maybe other sorts of methods also. Okay, so in the end, we ended up with um, a uh, very close agreement in terms of the energies for these um, four different methods, including two versions of DMRG, the smaller errors came from the hybrid real space momentum space. Um, now they all have error bars and you shouldn't think that there's something significant about the error bars not overlapping because there are some error bars that are easy to quantify like statistical error, but one has no idea how to quantify the constraint error in the quantum Monte Carlo. So these only show the easy errors. And um, you know, without this sort of comparison, you don't really know what the uncontrolled errors are doing. In this, this case, it's, it's primarily extrapolation um, for the DMRG to a small cylinder to a wide cylinder. Uh, so the, a key result here is, first of all, this general agreement was finding that all of the states were striped. And then this key issue of the amount of holes, the filling per stripe, um, was nearly degenerate. Okay? So this lambda here is the spacing between the stripes. So in this particular filling, um, the stripes at a spacing of eight are filled with holes, so one hole per unit length of stripe. Um, over at four, this is one hole per two unit length of stripe. Okay? And you can see that over at four, the energy is noticeably higher. But once you're a little bit higher in energy, you have this very close near degeneracy. Um, okay. What about superconductivity? Okay, well, so um, uh, this, this, there's lots of results that I could show and it's a little bit hard to sort of pick out the pieces. Um, this shows a little bit of what's going on. Uh, let me just point out one particular thing. The scale that shows the pairing in this DMET calculation is much lower than the scale uh, that is shown here. Um, in particular, it's sort of in between the stripes, it's particularly low. Okay, uh, but uh, so just to sort of give you the digested version, what we find for pairing is that for filled stripes, um, there's no D-wave pairing, it's just gone. For partially D filled D-wave stripes, the D-wave pairing is seen, but not so consistently, okay? And so the logical conclusion from that is that there's nearly degenerate superconducting and non-superconducting states when you are sort of in this uh, partly filled stripe regime. Okay, so to summarize what we saw uh, comparing these four different methods, at this particular, this was pretty focused on one point in the phase diagram because this was a lot of work. Um, and there was clear agreement that the Hubbard ground state at this point is striped. Um, a near degeneracy was found in the stripe filling. So the half-filled stripes were higher in energy, unlike the TJ model, where the half-filled stripes were preferred. And the filling for this other higher range of, of stripes, the, the energies for the higher range of fillings of stripes were nearly degenerate. Okay, and then filled stripes had no superconductivity and partially filled stripes give mixed results on pairing. Okay, so um, getting uh, uh, just in the last year or so, we uh, combined forces with just two of the methods, the DMRG and the, the Monte Carlo. Sorry, Steve, could I ask you one Please question? Please go ahead, yes. Yeah. So supposing I, I take your result and just say I put Coulomb on top of it, then what, would you, what, would I, what, what stripes would be preferred? The Coulomb interaction, we, we did uh, analyze that at a mean field level, 
uh, right. the sort of long range part of the Coulomb interaction. Um, that, um, you know, if you just put too many holes in the same place, like a filled strike, they don't like, it doesn't like that. So right. it shifts everything more towards half filling. Okay, so okay. that is one effect. It pushes it in the right direction to compare with experiments. And the other mm -hmm. effect that also seems to do that is a T prime. Okay, okay. and that's, uh, um, yeah, that's uh, there's some work that I'll point out by uh, uh, Philippe Corbeau's work that uh, sort of shows that. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay, so, um, so this figuring out what the superconductivity does in more detail is, is difficult, more difficult than seeing the stripe states. And so we sort of uh, tried to focus even harder uh, combining these two methods, validating the, uh, the uh, quantum Monte Carlo with its sort of constraint on um, the widest that accurate ladders we could do with DMRG, and then extend the Monte Carlo to wide enough ladders for finite size extrapolation. And the conclusion of this was that um, we found at this particular point, we could extrapolate to the two-dimensional limit and find an absence of superconductivity. And this is in the pure two-dimensional model, model, but what, what we meant by pure was without any T prime, just T prime equals zero. Along the way, we sort of, um, uh, sort of, it turns out to be, you have to be very careful with one of our cylinders. The width four cylinders actually have two types of D-wave pairing. And that can sort of muddle up uh, the analysis. And so we have a recent preprint just on that. Okay, so first let me show you, and this is uh, Chao Min's, uh, Chao Min Chung's um, uh, DMRG uh, with sort of the best techniques. Um, the bond dimension you can see in these calculations is up to 22,000. So that's, that's sort of very impressive. And um, we're looking at the pairing response on a width six ladder uh, with doping 1A. Okay, and so even with 22,000 states, you haven't really converged in terms of the pairing correlations. There's still an extrapolation that you have to do, okay? Um, but, and once you do that, then you can sort of look at this and decide whether these pairing correlations are decaying as an exponential form or as a power law. Okay? And they look like they're decaying as uh, uh, an exponential form. Um, and um, there's two ways that we can do this. Uh, the pair-pair correlation is the less reliable, um, you know, for some sort of technical reasons. Uh, it's usually more reliable to apply a pair field along the edge and look at the decay. This will converge faster in DMRG and the numbers are all just sort of bigger so you can uh, see things more clearly. Okay. And uh, so that's the result here, but the, the results are, are consistent, that this is consistent with exponential decay of the pairing correlations. Okay. They are still of the D wave form. Now, this is just the width six system, and what we're interested in is the extrapolation to the thermodynamic limit. So here are some of the comparisons in, between the Monte Carlo and the DMRG on the, some of the narrower cylinders. And we did this also in the width six, but this is just width two and four. And um, there was some development of the techniques for measuring things in the Monte Carlo. So we could measure, measure things through energy measurements instead of uh, property measurements because the energy measurements were more accurate. But once we had sort of developed those techniques, we found a very um, high level of agreement between the quantum Monte Carlo and the DMRG. Okay, then we could take the Monte Carlo to significantly wider systems up to width 12. And uh, so this shows some of the results. And to try to get to the thermodynamic limit, we had to, to you know, worry, worry a lot about sort of what technique would give us a reliable, reliable result. So this technique was to apply a pair field on all the links. And then we want to take the limit that this pair field applied in the Hamiltonian goes to zero and look at the response. But you have to do that carefully in considering the uh, thermodynamic limit. So what you need to do is for a fixed value of the field, you have to take the thermodynamic limit. And then the final extrapolation shown here is extrapolating with the field 
um, where each point is in the thermodynamic limit. And, and if you do the, the limits in the opposite way, you'll just always get zero no matter what, what the quantity is. Um, so, uh, so here we, we extrapolate essentially to zero. And you know, this, this technique is quite reliable, say if we do it on just the, the magnetization that half filling, we already know what goes on. Okay, so the conclusion is that there's no long range superconductivity in the thermodynamic limit at this particular point. And why is that? Well, um, if you look versus this pairing field and look at the strength of the stripes, uh, the stripe amplitude is shown in red, and then you look at the strength of the pairing, you're seeing they're competing with each other. One goes down and the other one goes up. Okay, so it appears that these, these uh, commensurate stripes appear to be killing the pairing. And these stripes are also filled stripes, so that's the other thing that makes this particularly uh, bad. Although the, the uh, uh, energy difference between filled and not filled is very, very small. And you get similar sorts of results even if you're a little bit away from that filling at this particular dopamine. Okay, so to summarize what we have here, for superconductivity in the Hubbard model, at one-eighth doping, these parameters, we can extrapolate uh, to the thermodynamic limit to find an absence of superconductivity. And this absence of superconductivity is driven by two, two strong commensurate striping along with filled stripes. Okay. Um, but an important point to note about the, at this, and this is a, involves uh, uh, work by other groups, is that the role of T prime is crucial um, and it's also, I would say, not really understood. There are sort of particular things that are, you know, particular nice calculations, but the whole picture is difficult still to understand. But uh, T prime certainly weakens the stripes, and it tends to shift the stripe filling as, as shown in this recent IPEPS paper, where these, uh, by Fleet Corbeau and his group, and um, the, the, these different W, whatever, is uh, stripes with a width four, stripes with a width five. Um, around T, and it's versus T prime and near T prime equals zero, there's lots of near degeneracy. Uh, there's less near degeneracy around here. So there's a crucial role that T prime plays um, that, uh, that uh, uh, I don't have time to talk too much about and we, we don't really understand. And also the Stanford group has been um, uh, doing some, some key work on the uh, role of T prime. Okay, so now let me uh, talk about some very recent results, not yet published. Um, so my student Shang Tao Zhang, um, I, I realized well it had been quite a while since we had revisited the TJ model to try to see if with uh, improved calculations we could uh, sort of figure out things better. And um, so Doug Scalpino has uh, joined in on this. And so this is the three of us working in the last uh, couple of months. And um, so right away, you can see that we're doing bigger systems than we did in the past. Um, you know, this is a width 10 system and you should see that it's still striped, okay? Um, and uh, so we're still seeing uh, mostly consistent results, but the most subtle thing is relative to the superconductivity. And in our old results, those were always, um, you know, the, the thing that we had the most difficulty with and we were the most cautious about, okay? So now we're getting to be able to see this more clearly. So let me show you a few results uh, uh, that Chang Tao has gotten uh, recently. Okay, so these are all with uh, J over T of 0.4. Okay, and um, so the, let's start at the bottom panel. This shows the ground state of the system. Um, you can see the stripe pattern. You can see the uh, antiferromagnetism here. So this is at a doping of one eighth. And um, this is a measurement, in this case, it's a pair correlation where one of the pairs, one of this, the, the, the location of one of the pairs is, the, is this bond. And then it's plotted for all the other bonds where we measure the other part of the pair correlation. Okay, and you can see the D-wave nature of most of this, but this um, is uh, uh, 
let's see, where does it say? It says here, log 10. This is on a log 10 scale. So this curve here, which is decaying more or less linearly, is showing exponential decay. The values are getting very small towards the edge of the system. So this is showing a system with a very weak response at this particular filling of 1 8 where the stripes really seem to be the strongest. Okay. But um, just to sort of give a little more uh, texture to that, we get a sort of different result if we do the measurement with this other type of thing where we apply a pair field operator on one link and look at the response to that. And you know, generally we think that this is a um, more accurate result. And so now this, this curve here is not on a log scale. This is just showing the bare results and you see a much bigger response. And you, wouldn't, you would not be able to tell too much difference in looking at the stripe patterns, okay? So we're seeing a much bigger response just from sort of tweaking the system a little bit with a pair field at one link. So it, it seems clear that there are some very low lying states very nearby that um, have more uh, pairing. And um, you know, it looks like in this particular case that this one is maybe a little bit higher in energy, but it's very close by. Okay. So now let's look at a, a little bit higher doping. And so this might be pretty close to where you would say there's optimal doping in the, the coup rates. Um, and um, so what's interesting here, I'm going to show you three different results on essentially the same system. Um, now these, when we apply a pair field in the system, we have to do it in a grand canonical ensemble with a variable number of particles. And so we apply a chemical potential, but we don't actually know how many particles we're going to get. Okay. And so here's a system with stripes and moderate level super superconducting response. And it's sort of asymmetric. You see a weaker response on the left and a stronger response on the right. And so it looks like, again, we have these competing states that are sort of fighting for each other. And they, they look very similar, but they have different responses. Okay. And so that's the calculation just with this pair field on the center. But here's another calculation with a slightly different initial state. Okay. And here we see much more clearly this a different state. Um, that, uh, so it, the doping comes out a little bit higher. Um, but we see a much stronger response to the pairing that persists all across the system. Okay? So the pairing response is this blue line with this magnitude of 0 0.044, which is quite significant. It's got stripes. So the orange curve is showing the density. So that's showing a stripe pattern. And you can see the stripes here. Uh, so you see the, it looks a bit like they're site-centered stripes. Uh, so the domain walls look like they're on sites. We don't think that's too significant. Uh, and the spin structure of the stripe is a little bit more apparent than the density structure of the stripe. Okay, so that's a second state. And then here's a third case. Again, just slightly different doping, uh, slightly different initial conditions. And, uh, but the main thing that's different here is that we do a different type of experiment where we put a pair field, which is pretty weak, 0 0.01, across all the bonds. So we're really trying to force this stronger pairing state. Okay, and we get a very strong pairing response. We still see it hasn't killed off the stripes. Uh, we still see a stripes. Their um, amplitude in um, the density is not too large, um, but you still see this, this spin pattern. Okay, so to, to summarize what we're getting for these, um, Here's these three different cases. Um, they're all with a doping of around 0.17. Okay. State number one had a pretty strong um, CDW and a weaker superconductivity. And then case two had a, a weak, little bit weaker superconductivity and, and strong superconductivity. And, and so does this other one over here with the global pair field. Okay. So we can compare these states and try to see, well, okay, which one is the, the true ground state. And the main conclusion is that, that they're so close we can't resolve them too well. 
Okay, so here's the, the bond dimension, the truncation error that we got for each of these states. The energy per site, okay, but another way of looking at, at the energy, you know, the, the biggest change in the energy can come from just how much doping you actually got. And so you can look at the energy per hole where you subtract off an antiferromagnetic background, and that sort of gives another way to compare it. And essentially, these things are nearly degenerate. Okay. Um, so um, so we, we seem to have a clear case. First of all, we're seeing some states that these stronger superconducting states we didn't see in the early days of, um, uh, of the, the TJ model with these vertical strikes. Um, the vertical strikes tend to gap out superconductivity um, if the strikes are too strong. Um, you know, how does superconductivity work? Well, it, superconductivity works from um, pairs sort of delocalizing into sort of a, a Bose, Bose condensed gas. And um, so for that to happen, the pairs have to sort of come on and off the stripes pretty freely. And if they're just stuck on the stripes because of an energy difference between the different numbers of holes in the stripe, um, you won't get much. Um, and so that seemed to be what we usually saw uh, in the earlier days uh, with the vertical stripes. We didn't get much of a response, but in this case, we're seeing that there's some, some states very close by, a um, little bit harder to access with the MRG that are showing the stronger stripe pairing. Okay, finally, the last result I want to show is um, one of the fun things we like to do with these DMRG experiments is um, to change the parameters of the system along with the length. You know, we usually we're doing um, uh, sort of a finite system calculation. And of course, the, the infinite methods have their own advantages. But one advantage of just doing a finite cluster is that we don't have to make the, the model parameters the same at every point. And so in this case, we slowly changed the chemical potential from the left side of the system to the right in a linear fashion. Okay, so this resulted in a change in the doping, which we measure and is shown on this dashed red curve. Okay, so we go from a doping uh, of around 0.18 all the way up to an you know, pretty overdoped uh, regime of 0.33, okay? And throughout this regime, we're seeing a strong dome uh, superconducting response, okay? And so this is a, with a global pair field put on everything pretty small. We, we're, we're working on making this even smaller. Um, and what you see when the system does this, it goes to, uh, regime where there's sort of clear stripes and then the stripes get a little bit more smeared, smeared out and more and more smeared out, but you still see the sort of spin patterns for quite a while until, you know, eventually at, at the higher doping, the, the, the spin structure is sort of disappearing. So there seems to be a smooth evolution of these sort of stripes to more smeared out stripes as you go along with a robust pairing response to that. Okay, so, uh, so Sheng Tao sent me, a, you know, about 30 different slides like this that I could have shown, and I just picked out a, a couple of them. Um, and so this is very much work underway. We're trying to sort of digest this and understand things and, and understand this overdoped regime. Um, but uh, so, so to, to summarize these recent TJ results, okay, so previously there was these vertical rings of stripes on cylinders seem to gap out the superconductivity. You know, a, a, a particular ring might like exactly four holes and not two or six. And um, so it'd be too high an energy barrier and we wouldn't see uh, the superconductivity so well. But now with just sort of better techniques, uh, more states, uh, we find uh, some new stronger pairing states for uh, uh, near optimal doping. They still have stripes present, uh, but with near degeneracy with the, the weaker pairing, stronger strike states. And um, as the doping increases to quite uh, uh, large doping, the stripes gradually weaken and the pairing response is still significant, but, but falling. Okay, so just to give some overall conclusions, the key physics 
in the doped Hubbard and TJ models is a competition of stripes and superconductivity. And these orders are not um, exclusive, but they tend, uh, tend to compete to a certain degree. They come from the same origin, and uh, so, they, so they're sort of linked together. The phase diagrams are complicated, and the results depend sensitively on doping and model parameters, and, and of course, computational details like exactly what size cluster or, or cylinder or whatever you're using. Okay. But the main conclusion is that after a long time, the simulations, mostly by tensor network methods, are finally closing in on reliable ground state phase diagrams of the Hubbard and PT model. Okay, thanks. So, take questions. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Steve, for this uh, great talk and very enthusiastic outlook. <laughs> All right. I'm sure there are questions. Yeah, and I'll, I'll share again as soon as I have a question. Well, I, I have one. So if you had to guess today, what phase diagram would you draw for the TJ and Hubbard as a function of doping? Well, I would, I would draw a complicated phase diagram. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I guess I didn't show it. Let me show you uh, a phase diagram that I, I, on a slide I didn't show. Uh, it's from another group, but I, okay, right here. Okay, so uh, I didn't show some of the detailed results on these width four cylinders, but so this is just a width four TJ, and, and look at this phase diagram on the lower right. This is from um, Steve Kibbleson's group. Okay, and they did a very, this is a DMRG study. They did a very careful job looking at uh, the phases of this width four TJ model, which where the DMRG can, can do a very good job on it. And you see this, quite complicated phase diagram. So, so the first thing is that it's going to be complicated. Anything. I don't think we see Oh, anything. sorry, so sorry, so sorry. Let me, it doesn't seem uh, I forgot to start the sharing. It's like <laughs> several things at once. Okay, let me start again. Tell us, COVID is the end Okay, of can the you see it now? Point. Yes, excellent. Yeah. Yes, okay. So, so on the, in this lower right, we see the, the uh, a T and a J of uh, you know one J over another, so there's you know slightly different pieces that you. This is down below is is T two and this is uh, J two over J one. So you vary some parameters, but it's just on a width four cylinder, and you get this very complicated phase diagram. Okay, there's no reason to think that it's going to just drastically simplify on the wider systems that I know of, um, and so that that would be the first thing that I would expect. Um, that it's uh, pretty complicated. And the other thing that uh, is sort of clear is that the, there's still questions about the role of T prime. Um, you know, this puzzle that we had at the beginning of um, the T prime having the opposite effect that you'd sort of naively uh, anticipate from experiments um, is still uh, a little unclear. and and. You know, the mapping between a three-band Hubbard model and a one-band model, which you sort of depend on to really relate to experiments, that's a, that's a complicated mapping. It's got various arguments in it. And, um, and uh, so there may be something that goes wrong in looking at, at, at such a sort of high resolution to distinguish these phases. Okay? So, um, it, but it is looking like the simple models are having the basic ingredients that we see in the cuprates, right? It's, it's the same basic pieces and so many things are coming out right, starting with the antiferromagnetism, but then the, seeing the stripes and seeing the D-wave nature of the pairing, seeing some of the, you know, incommensurate behavior of the antiferromagnetism. There's lots of things that the, the models are getting right, okay? But when they have a complicated phase diagram with lots of boundaries, then you really have to, be very quantitative to sort of match up at the next level of detail. And that's that's still uh, quite challenging. Well, I, maybe just to finish the thought, which is... It's coming into play with this four. Okay, Doug, why don't you go first? Me or... Doug? What Steve, yeah. what Steve said earlier about the pairs uh, being on the surface, so to speak, of the tube, or on the cross-section, 
uh, as Steve said, become a real problem on four legs. And so I think part of the complication of this phase diagram Oh, we seem to have lost you, Doug. Uh, so what Doug is pointing out that these two different pairing phases are one reason for extra complication in this diagram. So, and that's that, what he said is right. So, um, so there, that is a reason that there may be somewhat less complication on, on um, uh, other systems. Okay, uh, Shivaji, you, you were not done? Uh, well, I was going to just say that, you know, the, if we look at the, I mean, the actual experimental compounds, you know, there are lots of them, and obviously microscopic details change between them, right? So, and the robust phenomena are you've got an antiferromagnet at one end and you've got superconductivity, right? They are the high TCs. So, one would want numerics on the right, or computations on the correct models to at least produce those two phenomena robustly, even if there's complications in between, as there are also in experiments which might marry, you know, vary from system to system. So, so, so looking, so, so there are two conclusions. One is you think that will come out, or you think maybe the short range models won't do it, or the one band model won't do it. And, you know, so do you have a sense now that you have a better sense of what the one? Yeah, I have a sense that, that this is, this is uh, continuing to work out well. Mm -hmm. So there's, um, uh, you know, an issue of uh, the sort of second order parameters and how they match up. So, so we, we can't, you know, if we just say, here are the coupe rates, and then here's, say, the Hubbard model without a T prime, without anything else, you know, mm -hmm. so just take a, a naive Hubbard model. Do they match very well? Well, now I, I would say we can simulate it well enough to say, no, they, they don't, we you need some other parameters, okay? Mm -hmm. See, it, it's like that we're seeing discrepancies that are real, and so now you say, okay, well, what are the other parameters? And then th that's the part that I'm, I'm uh, nervous about: um, how well we know these other parameters. You know, there's just a lot of art, and there's you know the other parameters come from uh, doing DFT calculations and downfolding, and then diagonalizing little uh, diagrams, and then throwing in a little bit sometimes of knowledge of what uh, um, uh, experiments, photo experiments are showing to sort of know if you have some things right. It's a little bit of a complicated thing. Um, and it, it seems like that that's done pretty well, but um, we do need to know the parameters pretty accurately to sort of think about connecting them up. And, and what about other parameters that we don't, we just aren't putting in the model yet? Are some of those particularly significant? Maybe some sort of putting off or something. On Phonons and coulombs. Yeah, and phonons and yeah, yeah. So the point is, is, superconductivity should come out reasonably robustly so that you can be confident that all these other things wouldn't destroy it, right? It shouldn't be infinitely unstable, otherwise we'd be stuck because you're never going to do it really to, to the nth detail. So anyway, that, yeah. that's basically, yeah. Right. And, and so if you, if you pose, so if you, first of all, if you look at the type, the symmetry of the superconductivity, whenever yeah. we see anything, it's always D-wave, so that's robust. Mm -hmm. And then if you look at um, pushing the system a little bit towards, um, uh, towards superconductivity, say by putting a weak pairing field on it, which sort of erases some of the effects of these small parameters, then you see a nice response that sort of matches a superconducting dome like you'd see in the Kubernetes. So a lot of that stuff is working. Okay, more questions. Um, sorry, can I ask a question? Um, hello? Go ahead. Yes, so do you have some physical picture for why T prime is so important? Uh, is it just to destabilize the stripes or is there some other mechanism? Well, let's see. Oh, uh, this is the right slide to address that. If you can look at um, the uh, upper right hand corner of this. Um, so uh, I'm teaching now a course in uh, uh, advanced, you know, the third quarter condensed matter physics where we're starting to talk about the Hubbard model or the TJ model. And so if you diagonalize a um, two by two TJ model, 
which you can do by hand and which I can assign to as a homework assignment to my students. Um, and, uh, you know, which, which Doug and I did early on and other people have done. Um, then you can see what T prime does. And um, so you see right away that, um, that there's a, you know, the phase that sort of corresponds to the D wave symmetry, um, that, that uh, a negative T prime is fighting that phase and a positive T prime is, is favoring it. So as you put on the negative T prime, it's trying to stop there being a D wave pair and put on uh, an S wave pair. And so it's just kind of fighting it. So you can sort of see that at the level of a two by two system. Uh, but um, and then those the, go ahead. Why isn't it surprising uh, that uh, you don't find superconductivity in the uh, Hubbard model without T prime? Say that again. Uh, because why is it surprising? Yeah, why is it surprising that you don't find any superconductivity in Hubbard model for T prime equal to zero if you say that it's obvious? So uh, let's see. I didn't say that. Oh, okay. So. Um, so at one particular point in the phase diagram, um, we you know, sort of did the full thermodynamic limit study, and we found an absence of superconductivity in the pure Hubbard model. Now, that one-eighth doping is also a point where in some of the experiments, you see a big dip in TC. So it's a commensurate point where the stripes can lock up more. So that's not cons inconsistent with experiments. Right? And so in terms of other points, um, well, we don't have as good results yet, and we just have sort of, you know, different results, but uh, it's certainly reasonable to think that, that at other points, other dopings, we're seeing um, uh, superconductivity, but it depends sensitively in the details on what T prime is doing, or what, what T prime is. And I feel like a question T prime does, which is it makes, uh, depending on its shine, it makes uh, hot spots on the Fermi surface, or it, it cuts the diagonal, and you begin to get umclaut processes that become present depending on the sign of T prime and the filling. And uh, do 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 you also see asymmetry of T prime uh, with respect to the sign uh, for particle doping? Uh, well, it. it um, uh, Let's see, there's mappings that, so for the TJ model won't allow you to dope above that filling. The Hubbard model has a symmetry that, uh, you know, you don't need to look on the other side. It just changes the uh, T prime. Mm. Okay. Thank you. And uh, just to add to what Doug just said, um, you know, there are weak coupling pictures and strong coupling pictures. And, um, the, you know, they, in the case of T prime, there's a, there seems to be a little bit of disagreement between what the sort of simplified weak coupling picture would say about the shape of the Fermi surface and, and what sort of, sort of scattering can go across between points on the Fermi surface, what T prime does to the shape versus the strong coupling little diagonalizations of TJ models. Those seem to give not exact, not completely consistent results. Um, the weak coupling is sort of agreeing more with experiments and the strong coupling is agreeing less. Um, so that's another complication. So I have a question. Um, what would happen if we add disorder to these types of calculations? Have you thought about that? Um, so we have some of the calculations that we've done in the last week or two have uh, some disorder. And uh, so we're very interested in that, um, but it's a little bit too early to um, say exactly what's going on. I can say that the, the very first calculations that Shang Tao did with a disorder put on at the higher doping regime, um, you know, they certainly had an effect on weakening the pairing, but it wasn't enormous. Uh, so, so we're still trying to digest that and, you know, do other calculations. But that's certainly a very interesting uh, thing. Important physical effect. I have a couple of questions, naive ones. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, first one is um, I have uh, seen two papers at least which report uh, a nodeless superconductor in the extreme underdoped doped site uh, around uh, between doping uh, 0.06 to 0 0.08 uh, whole doped site. Um, there, um, uh, uh, what do you say about that? Is it um, beyond these models or? Well, uh, so I don't, I haven't seen that particular work. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't say it that is when we, yeah. So so it's a little um, it's a little bit difficult sometimes to sort out what's going on at the very low uh, mm -hmm. very low doped uh, case. Um, the system sizes, you know, suppose suppose it was stripes getting farther and farther apart, then you need a bigger system. Um, mm -hmm. You know, various things can happen that mean you need a bigger system. Um, <laughs> And there's been some reports of different types of stripe phases, um, mm -hmm. say diagonal stripes. Um, and um, you know, we, we have sometimes seen diagonal stripes as being reasonably close by in energy. Um, and, but I, I really don't know exactly what's going on in the far underdoped regime. Okay. And uh, one more question. Uh, when one thinks of um, the Cooper pairs as pairs of holes, um, uh, how does one uh, rationalize its singlet nature? Uh, because now there is no real spin involved in these uh, whole degrees of freedom, right? Um, right. So how does one think of the singlet uh, there? Right. Well, um, of course, we can, we can solve a um, uh, you know, one, a small system with two holes on it and sort of look at the structure. It's starting with the, the smallest, the two by two. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, you can, uh, you know, on the two by two, when you have two holes on it, then it's, of course, it's the electrons that are left that are forming mm -hmm. a singlet. And so you can look at the wave function as the singlet sort of hopping around itself. And it's the singlet will spend a lot of its time on the sort of diagonal configuration because it has to be there in between getting to the adjacent configurations. So you can you can look at that um, and um, in terms of yeah sort of understanding what the um, there's, there's yeah we've looked at some other things that we could measure relative to that but um, I can't really I'm not sure what to say about the specific question of how to think of their you know whether they're a singlet or not. Okay. So can one uh, naively think of it like this, that uh, these holes are uh, hopping around in uh, the antiferromagnetic background and the uh, uh, antiferromagnetic uh, um, or the electrons, uh, actual electrons also tend to uh, hop around um, in pairs because of uh, hopping of these hole pairs. And those um, spinful electrons form singlets. Is that uh, the way to think about well, in the in the if we think about the TJ model, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of easier to think about, then um, the holes moving are really just the electrons hopping onto the hole, and yeah. so there, there's it's just a, a language, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it's really just like where are the vacancies, and but, uh, but the thing that would probably matter is um, about uh, Cooper pair density. If one is talking about um, holes as the pairs, then um, the Cooper pair density, will that be uh, less compared to if one is talking about um, the electrons themselves as forming singlet pairs? Uh, let's see, I'm not sure I quite understand what your point of view is, but... Um, but the super uh, pair density yeah, like, does go to zero in the Mott limit, right? For that reason, which is to say that, but, but, but I don't see why Doug doesn't answer this question since he's <laughs> on the call. Well, Steve, Steve looked at this, uh, I think a long time ago with Xiao Zhen Zhang and myself and what Steve and what we found at that time uh, was we could look at superfluid density, at least for negative U. We tried to look at it for mm -hmm. positive view and we weren't able to get cold enough. But let, let me come back for just a minute to the question of interaction uh, and what's forming the holes. There's a calculation by Steve and Nejat Balut and myself where uh, Steve did quantum Monte Carlo looking at the uh, 
two, part, two particle scattering and was able to see within that framework that the pairing interaction would form uh, D wave pairs. Uh, it also formed some other strange odd frequency objects, but you could see from the point of view simply of the two particle vertex mm -hmm. that the model tended to have, have an interaction that favored singlet D wave pairing. Okay. Uh, and that was not this type, not this strong coupling TJ picture, but a somewhat weaker coupling picture, but it, it was still determinantal quantum Monte Carlo. Okay. I'm not sure that helps, but it's another picture of why things pair. I see. Thank you. Okay, so, but uh, let me, let me, so maybe this is a very interesting discussion, but I think uh, we should maybe try to wrap up the uh, discussion. Is there one more urgent question? I wanted to make one comment that, you know. Yes, that's the, also okay. Which is that we, we're in uh, a world where strong correlation physics is now extremely important because the new economic problem is to solve for an equilibrium where everybody is six feet from each, each other. <laughs> and that's very much like the sort of problem that Steve is solving. <laughs> well, on that note, I think we should thank Steve very much for this great talk. Uh, I would also like to thank all the participants. There were 100 participants, Steve. So this is, a, I think, a huge success for a very first uh, a seminar series. So you will hear from us back again. There will be, we will try to do this uh, uh, often. We have not really completely decided uh, what the uh, what, what the time frame is in which somehow we will do this, but we will, uh, given somehow the amazing response of 100 people, uh, we will certainly continue with uh, these uh, the seminar series. So Steve, you set the example. It will be very difficult to follow for everybody else, uh, but that's uh, that's. Uh, I want to thank you again for the great talk, and I want to thank everybody uh, um, online to uh, to participate. So. Um, Keep in touch. Let's keep in touch. And uh, if you have suggestions for speakers for anything, just mail us, or uh, we will. Uh, we are very open uh, for everything. So thanks a lot, and um, good. And let me just say, it, I, it's really great to see everybody, even some of you, just your names. Uh, you know, it's uh, one of the nice things of, uh, of these Zoom things is that you get to see people that you don't run across uh, for years, and uh, so it's just great to see everybody. Yes, I fully agree with that. So, so let's try to make this um, a constant. So maybe let's we can we could we could just say that let's do it on Thursday. It's <laughs> always the same time um, for people in Europe. This is uh, much more relaxing than during the day. It's much harder, of course, for the people in the US. Of course, they don't have that advantage that they are sitting at home in their sofa. Um, but uh, anyway, <laughs> thanks a lot and uh, good night to everybody. <laughs>